the first day there is real important. I remember arriving at college, and the worst part was my parents left. And there I was sitting in this room with two people I'd never met before. And one was a fellow from Pittsburgh who came in with a full year of college credits. The other one was a fellow from Massachusetts, which is where I was going to college, who had this whole social life and was heading off to go drinking, while the other fellow was wandering around trying to find out what a gut course was, or which courses were guts, and I had no idea what the word meant, and <clears throat> didn't want to let on that I didn't have any idea what the word meant. And so they both headed off, and there I was sitting in my room, and it was pouring. And next door, there were two guys playing a record by a group called The Mother's Invention. And, the, and what it was was Susie Cream Cheese. Or I guess it was The Fugs, and it was called Susie Cream Cheese. And what it was was it's um, an oral account of sexual intercourse, screaming next door. And here I am, this naive kid, and I have no idea what all this noise is. There's an upperclassman next door with a whip who's banging it on the floor as hard as he can. And then there's this guy who is obviously, um, I'd never met anybody who used drugs, who is obviously on drugs, uh, writing on a table outside my room. Now, when I say writing on a table, I don't mean writing on a piece of paper or on a table. I mean, this guy's writing on a table. And I sat there in the rain listening to this, thinking, my life has just ended. And I thought, I better write somebody a letter. And I wrote, here I am at college, and this is wonderful. Um, I'm just loving being here, thinking, I hope I can make it through the week. And that was my initial experience in college. The whole world was changing when we were in college. Um, by the time I arrived, we'd had John Kennedy telling the nation, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. After him, there was Lyndon Johnson who promised America a great society. Money was pouring in. We saw people beginning to vote in parts of the country in which they could never vote before. There was a sense that anything was possible. Anything could happen. We were in the heels of a revolution. And that didn't mean a disruptive revolution, but the notion of making for a better society. Um, everybody was talking about a better society. We were watching federal programs pour out like crazy. So that he was a generation, my generation, my friends and I, who really believed we were going to live in a time in which the conditions that we saw as troubling would disappear. We could make them disappear. We were a generation, I think, that probably had three things. We had a real sense of hope. We had a real sense of responsibility and a real sense of efficacy that what we did mattered. And I think that sense of mattering came from a world in which some very large heroes walked. There were people, not only John Kennedy, but there were people like Martin Luther King. There were people like Robert Kennedy. And you watched them make a difference and realized you could too. Maybe you couldn't do it on a national scale. Maybe you couldn't do it alone, but the whole generation together could make it happen. And that was awfully, awfully exciting. So that this string, this stream of idealism was very, very powerful. You've personally felt it. Yeah, yeah. And I guess I still feel it. I remember periodically my life just falling apart as I had uh, what we then called identity crises, not being able to figure out who I am. The world was changing so fast and had to keep asking yourself, who are you and what do you want to do and what are you about and what's important? And the stimuli out there were so many. There were so many things to try and to do that every time I tried one, I began to ask myself, gee, who am I? What am I about? And I remember going through some severe depressions trying to figure out the answer to that question. Sometimes I thought I had it, and indeed I did, sometimes for hours or days. I remember one day sitting on a beach talking to friends when I realized I understand it all. I comprehend the whole world and its workings. Uh, that lasted for several days uh, before I realized you don't understand any of it. Uh, you don't understand, don't have the, le the least clue. So it was, a, it was a time of just incredible ups and downs as I tried to figure out who I was. Was it scary to, to be moving this quickly and seeing all this change? Did it frighten you? Sure, it frightened me. But no, it didn't frighten me. And as I really look back on it, it didn't frighten me at all. Um, there was a sense that change was good. Change was a synonym for goodness. So if we had a lot of change, it was all going to be good. Um, it all seemed to be, at least in the early 60s, through about, the late, through about 1968, it all seemed to be moving in the right direction, so that there was a lot that you could be excited about. Um, 
And yeah, it was, it was a time for enthusiasm, not for being upset. The other thing was I was 18, 20 years old. I was immortal. Um, there were no problems that I couldn't conquer, and I was going to be there to be part of this. And we're going to change the world. Modern day John Reed's. Was that the end of it for you, that buying that land? I mean, when did the whole thing, when did you know you, your life had to grow up or things had to change or you were at the end of the 60s? You know, there are a lot of different answers to that one. One answer is Kent State and Jackson State colleges in which police and military people shot and killed students who were protesting was one kind of end. I think that was an end to idealism or dreaming. Everything wasn't possible. There were constraints on what can be done. The next end came in 1972 with the McGovern campaign, in which here was a candidate who stood for a lot of the values that many of the people in the 60s had stood for, and he'd gotten the Democratic nomination. And to see his overwhelming rejection by the electorate showed that the country hadn't profoundly changed, or at least at that moment seemed not to have profoundly changed in the 60s. And that was another moment of disillusion. I could believe that Kenton Jackson State were aberrations, but this was a, a vote on the 60s by America, and it was fundamentally rejected. Then there's a third level at which it never ended. And for me, what that means is, I guess I chose education as a career because I believed it was the best way to change the world. It's the slowest. You have to be real optimistic to choose education as the way of changing the world, but I believed it was the best. And for me, that still goes on. I still remain in education. I care deeply about things that originally brought me in. And on those days in which I find myself becoming much too pragmatic, what I do is I take a trip to the Kennedy Library and I watch the tapes of Robert Kennedy talking about what the promise the 60s was so that it's still very much alive for me and what I do and think. You're still living as a 60s generation person. A piece of it. A piece of it. On one level, when I walk down the street now, I see kids who have purple hair, who have spiked hairdos, who seem to wear in clothes that are real unappealing. And I say to myself, God, I hope my daughter will never do stuff like that. Of course she will. I think every generation does that. Um, it's a way a generation builds a sense of a weeness. And I think that's probably a real common thing. It happened in the 50s, it happened in the 40s, it happened in the 30s. Every generation just looks different. I think what's striking about the, what we did was that it was such a quick departure and such a radical departure to watch men with hair down to the middle of their backs, um, to watch women with the same hair length, to watch everybody in jeans. Suddenly jeans were a uniform as opposed to work clothes. So that a piece of it, I think, was rebellion, which is we were going to be different. A piece of it embodied the idealism of the era, which is to say it was students in solidarity with workers and people of all stripes, um, the poor, um, those who were feeling the pain of our society the hardest. And so we wore similar kinds of clothes. I think it was also a group saying that the differences that have divided others, class issues, uh, race issues, are going to disappear for us because we're going to wear a certain set of clothings. The other kinds of behaviors were a society inventing new social rules. What are the sexual rules? What are the substances that people are allowed to use? Um, saying that this is going to be a more open society in which anything goes. We're going to let a thousand flowers bloom, hundred flowers bloom, lots of flowers bloom. And this kind of a regalia and these kinds of behaviors are going to be the way we show what we care about. So yeah, it wasn't only rebellion, it was more than that. Must have been fun too though. It really was fun. It was a wonderful era. <laughs>